My talk this morning is going to be rather short because I have some other little uh, tidbit for you that will take about 10 minutes in any case, and that will force me uh, to pay more attention to the time, we hope, because as you all know, I lose track of time when I'm participating with you and you're participating with me in the spiritual riches that we reach for together. Uh, the topic for this morning is the Kabbalistic interpretation of angelic forces. And of course, you know, I'm not going to give you a full interpretation in one short talk, because this, as almost any other important subject, takes quite uh, a series of lectures and or classes. However, there are various principles that we must come to understand. And these principles, incidentally, are, I think, so vital that not until we understand them more fully are we even remotely able to start handling, controlling, and directing the forces of our own nature, our own hearts, our own souls. And indeed, the ability to direct these particular forces has to do with our ability to reach into levels of our own nature, which for so long, and for so many of us, uh, have been absent or blocked away or perhaps not yet developed. We all vary. Now, we've all heard of angels. Some of us look at another person because that person has said something sweet or done something kind, and we say, you're an angel. Well, you know what? We're right. <laughs> Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we are understating the case because we have come to think of angels as being something more uh, than the divine human soul. In Kabbalah, we do not think of the angelic forces in this way, nor are they handled in the manner that most people think they should be handled because I think you should realize that Kabbalah, being the esoteric wisdom of Israel, coming to us through many thousands of years, many thousands of years before Christ indeed, that Kabbalah gives us uh, the principles of something that has been known, understood, worked with, tested, and expressed by those who have had what it takes to go through the disciplines and the training. Now let me try to give you some inkling of the idea of what angelic forces involve in Kabbalah. You see before you the tree of life, which is the symbolic representation of deity uh, in the universal sense in the expression aspect or manifest manifestation aspect of deity and also as an expression of each and every one of us, that is, the miniature, the, the drop that reflects the force and the knowledge and the beauty of the whole uh, to the extent that the drop can reflect with purity. In Kabbalah, if you will recall, I have often pointed out, we have what is called the four worlds. This is, incidentally, analogous to what our Eastern brethren talk about when they speak of the seven vehicles of man, each being a different vibratory state of the one being or the one center of consciousness. And the difference between the four and the seven really is not uh, as different as it sounds because in Kabbalah, the fourth aspect the fourth expression, the fourth world, or the fourth plane of expression, uh, includes four different areas. And in alchemy, they have been called air, fire, earth, and water. Air, fire, earth, and water. Actually, this really involves the four aspects of our personality expression, which on the tree of life, we see as being below that central yellow sephira 
and the Sephira, remember, is in Kabbalah called an emanation of the divine or God. So the four lower Sephiras, which is plural, Sephira is singular, actually include what in Kabbalah you might call the fourth world, divided into four again. So if you take the fourth world, thinking of these expressions, and then the other three, you have the same seven that our Eastern brethren have, except in a more detailed explanation, uh, therefore with an ability to understand more what these forces involve. Now, in the Bible, you have heard and you have read over and over again about the angels. Those of you who have followed the Eastern philosophies, uh, the Buddhistic, the Hindu uh, ideas, the Vedanta of thinking, uh, you have become familiar with the realization that we have within us seven bodies or seven vehicles. You have come to think, those of you who have studied that level or phase of uh, occult teaching, you have come to think of angels as being a representation of another order of life. Now this, in accordance with Kabbalah, is exactly accurate. The order of life that we call the angelic order. Of course, we know that certain modern materialistic psychiatrists, they hear us talk this way, would figure we all belong in padded cells. And so it's very lucky that we have freedom of speech and religion. Uh, and this way we avoid the padded cells. Because, as you know, those who are supposed to actually believe in angels, fairies, uh, elemental forces, and so on, are said to be very, very uh, psychically sick indeed by the materialists who can see nothing beyond their own noses, even though they may, on the material plane, appear to have quite a mind, quite an intellect. I ought to know. I was once like that. Only, fortunately, I outgrew it. Some people get stuck in these ruts. But let's consider what the Kabbalistic idea of angelic forces really involves. Now, when we think of the four worlds of Kabbalah, those of you who have been coming to my Thursday night classes will understand this more fully. The rest of you will surely receive something of value. Because, as you know, we work with each and every one of you when we gather together. Uh, the forces of light and of life are involved with every aspect of the vehicle that we form as we reach together towards something beyond ourselves in order to be something more than we are. So let's consider what is involved in the idea of angelic forces. I hope you believe in angels because I think it's pleasant. Uh, now, you may say, well, but suppose it's pleasant and untrue. The point is, I hope you believe in angels, not only because it's pleasant, because, but because you realize that consciousness must surely have many levels and areas of expression. In Kabbalah, relating to the four worlds, we have what is called the top, the first, the archetypal world, as representing that which is called the direct action of deity itself on different planes. And this is why in Kabbalah we have the different divine names for each of these ten divine emanations which we call the tree of life. Each divine name, it doesn't mean there are ten uh, different uh, gods, Although, in a way, it's true. If you're willing to admit that ten gods cannot be one god expressing in ten different ways. Uh, surely, as you've heard me point out to you before, the fact that I am 
a very objective and scientific type of mother. <laughs> So that when I tell you that my daughter is about the most perfect daughter God ever made, uh, the fact that I make this uh, scientific statement to you shows that I am utterly without prejudice, <coughs> doesn't take away from the fact that uh, my daughter has other areas of expression which someone else might criticize, uh, but not before me. Uh, my daughter, to me, is the most perfect daughter the deity has ever created. Now, if you have daughters, you will think the same about yours. And I'll tell you a secret. We're both an, or all correct. In other words, the ability to be many things does not take away from being the one thing. The capacity to express in many areas does not take away from the fact that it is one central glory that is the expressor and the inspirer. Now, I, as I pointed out, being a scientific mother <laughs> and most objective, just merely objectively tell you my daughter is just perfect uh, as far as I'm concerned. However, I also have a couple of grandsons. And there again, I'm a, I'm, I am objective. And I say these are the most extraordinary, glorious grandsons God ever made. Now, you may feel the same way about yours. And we're both, or all of us, right. Uh, again, this means that I am both a mother and a grandmother. I'm not, my child and I, remember, insist we were child brides. <laughs> this helps us to remain eternally young. <laughs> then we go along to our other relationships. The husband, wife relationship, the friend relationship, the sister relationship, sister and sister or sister and brother. Uh, teacher and disciple and all the other infinite kinds of relationships that exist. Now, as I pointed out in the little pamphlet that I wrote under inspiration from our greater teacher, the fact that I can be a mother and say, my daughter is perfect, the fact that I can be a grandmother because I was a child bride, remember that, and so was my daughter, <laughs> uh, and say, my grandsons are perfect. The fact that I can be a sister, and um, from my point of view, say, my sister is perfect. Of course, lot, lots of people will disagree, but I say they haven't uh, developed vast enough vision. <laughs> the point is, the fact that I can be a teacher and look upon you and say, you are the most beautiful thing God ever made, creatures of glory. The fact that I can look out at a tree and a star and see all of these various expressions of the miracle of deity as being perfection, does this make me something other? No, in each relationship, remember, in each and every relationship, I am expressing a very unique quality of my own me, and yet I am always whatever it is that I am, whether you like it or not, whether you enjoy it or not, some would love it, some would hate it, some would be indifferent. Again, here is a difference, a reaction to certain levels of awareness or expression. The point is, I am still always me. Now, with deity, according to Kabbalah, we have the same thing, you know, as above, so below, as within, so without. Deity, then, according to Kabbalah, expresses in ten basic, vast principles which you see presented on the tree of life. And each of these expressions or vibrations have a very special kind of expression 
vibratory expression. And so when we have a one divine name for the number one aspect or expression, when we have another divine name for the second, third, and right on down to the tenth, the ten basics, what is it that we're doing? Are we taking away from the oneness and unity of deity? No. We're showing that deity is smart enough to be complex and have complex expression. And yet it is always deity. Just like I am I, whether I am expressing my thoughts or feelings in relation to my daughter, my grandson, my sister, my friends, my adorable spiritual children, my spiritual sisters and brothers, because these are as profound my own as any physical relationship could be, or whether I am expressing in whatever other myriad number of ways I can, and uh, I have a good imagination, I can express an awful lot of things, but I won't tell you about it. You might appreciate some of them, though deity does. Deity does. This is the point. Therefore, when we think of deity, we have to realize that deity on one level has one type of principle that is expressed. But when deity is expressing on the next level, uh, we see it in another way. You've often enough heard the story that our Eastern brethren give of the blind men who felt the elephant and each of them des describe the elephant differently, depending on what part of that elephant they touched. You know, if it was a trunk, it was a serpent. If it was the legs, it was a, it was a pillar. If it was the side, it was um, a wall, and so on. And each of them were correct, but limited, very limited indeed. And it is up to us to be working at expanding our consciousness. Now, in order to expand our consciousness, we have to be willing to give up the narrow interpretations that we had yesterday, which we inevitably have to have had. We always go from less to more. This is evolution. And to give up our narrow interpretations, we have to be able to see that the different levels or planes of expression of deity really involve the different levels that we are able to reach at the moment consciously. And when we don't know they're there, they're still there. You know, you can deny that the sun rises and sets from now till doomsday uh, if you are blind. But this will not change the fact, will it? The sun will still rise and the sun will still set whether we believe in it or not. In the same way, we can get fixated. Thank you. He got my loving, adoring thought. Our precious, beloved Frater Felix. Maybe even an open door will help because uh, I hate to have people fall asleep when I talk. <laughs> it's liable to develop an inferiority complex in me, and God knows we have enough problems <laughs> without adding that kind of nonsense, don't we? <laughs> Not that it would. Uh, I'm quite aware of what is occurring uh, on the inner levels as we are together, as you know. The point is then that deity is expressing uh, in different ways, on different levels. And these different ways, different levels, have to do with a stepping down of energy in order to bring about a development of an awareness on self-conscious plane. That is, on the plane that you and I are working with and living in right now. So Kabbalah tells us that on the first plane called the archetypal plane, we have what is at all times, in all of the ten sephirah, actually, that which we call deity, but each of the names of deity is different. Why? Because there are ten gods, 
No. The very number one says, Yechida in Hebrew, the one, the indivisible. If it's the one and the indivisible, why are, are we divided? Well, it's because we're deluded. We're young. We're infants. We're immature. We misinterpret that which is occurring. It's part of a growth process. Uh, explain to a child the meaning of some kind of uh, mathematical calculus uh, or some kind of astronomical phenomena that has to do with nebula or with the sudden uh, supernova or nova explosions in a star. You can't. You have to develop and evolve the consciousness to be able to do it. So in the Kabbalistic training, you are definitely given to understand that you have these levels of expression and consciousness. And incidentally, you do not have the top come down to the bottom in the way most people think. Once you have achieved human consciousness, it is up to you to go from the bottom to the top. To become a conscious expressing instrument for deity. And this is why true occult training never attracts the masses. The masses want to go to those who will promise them everything. You know, a million dollars, top executive positions, power over others. Money, uh, money, 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 this materialistic age. This is what you will be promised by those who haven't even remotely achieved an insight or an experience that has to do with the evolution of life, of you, of beingness, of deity. And you are deity being evolved. Sparks of deity becoming self-conscious expressing aspects of the power of the, of the divine, which is you. We're all at different ages. Some of us are two-year-old, so we shouldn't be here. Some of us are seven or eight or nine years old. I'm talking about the inner. We also shouldn't be here. Some of us are at an age where we can start understanding. Well, we, we have been through enough hell where we have enough of what it takes to say, I want to become a self-conscious expression of that which is my true selfhood. And I say that with a capital S, as you well know. Now, the ability to be able to work towards that part of expressing deity really has to deal with these four worlds of angelic forces. Some of you may have been thinking, well, where do the angels come in? The topic says angels. Why isn't she talking about angels? I have been. Wait and see. <laughs> you'll realize it very fully, I hope. Or you'll realize it as much as you're able to at the moment. Some seeds need to grow, some spark off very quickly, it depends on the climate that's going on inside our minds and hearts at the moment. So what do, does Kabbalah have to say about angelic forces? Well, again, I take you back to the first point I tried to bring out. In the first or topmost level or world or plane or vibratory expression. You have what is called deity. And deity, or God, God, the creator of all, has different names in Kabbalah, not because this is a different God, but because each name is a vibratory formula for tuning in to deity on that level or that 
part of expression that is needed or required. And this training is given in full in BOTA, provided you shall improve that you're ready to take it, are able to handle it, and have the stamina and the patience to go through the preliminary training and testing. And most of you don't even realize what we consider the preliminary training and testing. And many of you don't even know that we're looking at you with a microscope. <laughs> and some of you suspect we are, and you don't like it. <laughs> In that case, you're not really ready to reach to greater beyond, truly. And that's all right, so sooner or later you will. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, every center of deity uh, is safe. Though with some of us, God knows how long it'll take. Good thing God knows, because most of us don't. The point is that each and every one of these ten emanations on the tree of life are representing what is called the deity level, the, uh, the archetypal level of the expression of that particular quality. Like the number one is the real awareness of I, I. When it achieves universal awareness of I, it knows that I and universal I are one. Uh, which you never have lost, incidentally, not really. Uh, you've just become condensed away and unaware of it, and you do have to regain it if you want to, with your personal evolution, know that you, as an individual, are eternally at one with the I of the universal I. Uh, you earn this. It isn't given to you as a gift. Uh, you earn everything. If you are loved, you earn it. If you are hated, you earn it. Sometimes we're hated and people say, this is unjust, we haven't earned it. This is not true. By de deciding to learn how to love as God loves, we automatically bring about certain hates because we have to be, our own higher soul has to be testing our own personalities to make sure that when we decide we are going to love as God loves, that nothing is going to swerve us, certainly not the nonsense of, of evolving personalities. We will have compassion. We will stop persecution. We should. But we will still not uh, be ignorant and lose ourselves in the nonsense of non-awareness when we truly aspire. So here we have on that tree of life the different levels or emanations or aspects or qualities, like the number one is the awareness of I, central I. The number two is the cosmic father force, the driving seed without which nothing could take place. The number three is the cosmic mother force, the womb that receives the seed and holds it together in order to grow evolution, livingness, consciousness. The number four is the organizing and mercy and compassionate aspect. These are all the one deity, but on, in whichever level, as they swing back and forth, really in a way like a lightning flash, whatever level it is, this is you. You have come through every one of these states. And you are still in the process of learning how to wake up and know who and what you are and how to use these powers. Now, if you think that you're going to be given a hocus pocus and say, Oh, thou Archangel Metatron, <laughs> come to me and give me this power. No. No. It will not happen. What you're likely to get if you're psychic is a nice little demon <coughs> saying to you, I am the Archangel Metatron. <laughs> and boy, would you be in trouble, and you ought to be, because how else are you going to evolve into a little discrimination? <laughs> and if you're going to reach up and to say, 
O thou archangel Michael, Raphael, this is what I want. It, even that you won't get it. Because some lovely little demon, if you are psychic, will come and delude you. It, you will be deluded and you will go the way of nonsense and the repercussions of your nonsense. Pain, tears, and sorrow. And then you'll wake up and you'll say, how could I, I have been so dumb? And then when you work further with this work, you will say, well, naturally, I had to be that dumb. How smart do you expect a five-year-old to be? <laughs> it's part of the process of understanding and evolving. The angelic forces in Kabbalah actually come into the third level just before physical manifestation. Now, on the top level, or the top world, which is called the archetypal world in Kabbalah, we have always the deity name. And remember, the deity name doesn't mean it's a different god. As I pointed out to you, you can call me a sister, and I am a damn, excuse my spiritual expression, good sister. <laughs> I am that. Does that keep me from being a mother? My daughter thinks that I'm out of this world as a mother. Clever of me to talk her into it, don't you think? Now, my grandson think I am just the, the most wonderful one. Of course, I bribe them. This is very bad psychologically. <laughs> But after all, <laughs> I give them a little toy, I hug them, I kiss them, I cuddle them, I give them a little this and that, and they've decided their grandmother is a, a, is a fairy or an angel. I mean, you can, inter you can interchange the terms. Well, I go for that. I think a child should have magic with which to grow up so it'll be open to the beauty of the livingness of consciousness as it evolves. I have certain friends, some of whom who say, if only Anne would do thus and thus and reform so and so and do the other thing, then she'd really be something. <laughs> and then I have other friends who want me to change in the opposite direction. <laughs> in other words, the so and so and changes of such and such that one group of friends would like me to have, the other group want me to reverse this. Some want me to be more expressive. Some say, that's bad. Let's make her less expressive. And yet they love me. And so I have certain expressions of friendship there. You see the point? Are you getting the idea? Everybody, and then my sister, says, you are marvelous. Anyone who doesn't see it should go to you know where. And I say, uh-uh, sister, that's unspiritual. <laughs> and she says, the you know where with that. And she has a beautiful scientific attitude towards me, not prejudice, you understand? <laughs> this is our little joke, naturally. The point is, we see and we react on various levels, and yet we're always the same. Deity sees, reacts, expresses, and creates on these various levels. But deity is the one, and we are the one. Now then, what does this mean, basically? It means that, first of all, on the top plane, deity knows itself in each of the expressions of the selfhood, number one, its own wisdom masculine powers, number two, as, a, uh, as the cosmic father, its own understanding and formulating powers, the number three, the cosmic mother, its own mercy and love, the number four, as its own center of outgoing need for benevolence. On the number five, deity knows itself as that which must bring everything back into harmony and balance, destroy the outmoded in order to rebuild for the new, and so people are afraid of it. It's called Geburah justice. That's the number five. Uh, in the number six, we have the Christ consciousness sees and knows how to understand and balance a tree. That's what we are after, incidentally, to balance that tree in our being 
and that's what we're working for. Then we go on to the desire nature in our classes. We give you more details on this, of the number seven to, uh, in the personality part of our nature, the number eight in the intellectual part of our nature, the number nine in the subconscious habit patterns and generic and uh, sexual drives of life in all its phases. And then finally, the physical manifestation that comes down to the bottom. But the point is, that the deity name is, in Kabbalah, a vibratory formula for each of these different aspects of, of expression. And we have taught you, as a group vehicle, to use some of them, not all, because it's dangerous. We will teach more when you achieve the level and have passed the tests and done the studies that show you have the ability to have the more, just like you can't get into college till you pass all your high school exams and your college entry exams. Uh, you have to take care of one before you go to the other. Now then, the angelic forces, as I pointed out, come into actually the third plane or level of deity. Is it separate from deity? Of course not. The first level you use the divine names for these different aspects of divine expression. On the next plane, called the plane of Bria, that's assigned to the divine mother, uh, you're dealing with the imaginative forces, the creative forces, which have to do, incidentally, with the archangels. And the archangels are what you might say the first and most direct expressions or emanations from the thought and intention of deity. Then on the further plane of expression, remember each vibratory element keeps changing. This happens in you. Everything you've ever been or done has gone through these four planes because that's the way it works. Even though you may want to divide the lower one uh, into the different uh, categories as has been done by our Eastern brethren, that's all right if you want to, but it's not necessary if you can see them as a whole. When you get then to that third uh, plane, which is called the formulative plane, Yitzira in Hebrew, that's where you're dealing with the actual angelic forces. Then when you get to the fourth plane, you're dealing with the centers, the chakras, as our Eastern brethren call them, the actual physical manifestation. Now, you do this all the time. You are working with the deity vibratory level, with the archangelic uh, push and creative surge, with the angelic level, which takes these vibrations and forms them. It's the formative aspect. And this is part of the detailed understanding that gives you a realization that everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever felt, this has form. Thinking has a form. Feeling has a form. Everything has a form. And that which we think and feel and charge with the vital energy of our eternal life, our, our spirit, manifests then into this fourth plane. The angelic forces, then, are not something higher than we are. Shocked? You'll find out. The angelic forces are absolutely dependent on our thinking and feeling elements. They come often in the guise of demons if we have demoniacal thinking and feeling elements. The angel, everything has its pair of opposites. The archangels are direct messengers or the first direct rays of expression from deity in its different aspects of beingness. The angelic forces spread out into more individualistic types of hosts of forces. And there is nothing you have ever thought, there is nothing you have ever felt 
that hasn't been registered in the subtle substance that is actually the substance of the angelic force. When you think of the angelic force as such, it is the archangelic level that brings you your help from above if you manage to overcome the lower levels of your own being. You have always been given everything you have really thought and felt because every way you have interpreted life has brought, a, brought to you the manifestation and it is the angelic forces that do it. In Kabbalah, we also call them the elementals because when they start manifesting into the physical plane, and the physical plane has four levels, part of which we do not see and call the astral level, what has really occurred, we shape. The angelic forces are not as highly evolved as human beings. This may shock you, but this I tell you. Somewhere in the Bible you will find that you have made them higher than the angels. Remember in Genesis, it, has, it says, man is now like us, and that is dealing with the level, the archangelic level, the seven spirits of God or deity. You then are not even remotely in the uh, evolutionary level, which our Eastern brethren call the uh, angelic uh, parallel evolution. You are something potentially, now I repeat, potentially more, certainly Archangels and the higher angels are more highly evolved than we are for their kind of vibratory force. But we, and that means every single one of us, have what it takes to become something more than the angels because the angels must follow the patterns of thinking and feeling of us. This is what Kabbalah teaches. They are the builders of the material universe through their uh, vibratory level on their kind of physical plane, which we call the elementals, things like the little fairies. Believe in fairies? Well, you're going to be surprised someday if you don't, <laughs> because everything is livingness. And you are the one who shapes and directs that livingness. You are the directors not only of your own life, but of the evolution of humanity. You are responsible for everything you think because the angelic forces can do nothing, absolutely nothing, except they take from your thinking and feeling and shape what you've thought and felt. This is what brings about what we call karma, incidentally. Karma is the gift to us of our own thinking and feeling. If it's hell, it just means we have to grow up a little more, become a little more spiritual, love humanity infinitely more, and things will start to change, of course. But bear in mind then that the angelic forces are not something to look to and say and call up to and say, help me. In the Western Kabbalistic school of thought, we reach right from the beginning. This is a very strict regulation and in fact, very serious obligations are taken. We reach first and foremost to that name of deity, the one deity, God, having to do with that particular level or aspect of our life and problem. We reach to that first. You begin everything with the vibration of deity. 
then you come down the archangelic angelic forces and into what they call the chakras the seven holy centers that we are awakening and growing through our thinking and feeling and studying and discipline we start with the top deity and work it in and through and it is your destiny it is your destiny to wake up and to know that you are actually evolving the angels they are not evolving you you are more than the angels though as an infant you're not in other words keep in mind an angel can be more highly evolved for an angel than you could be for a human being i hope not but it can be so but you are potentially more because the angelic forces uh, do not know good and evil they have not become as us as it says in the bible of the creation in genesis therefore you are the uh, the ones who are responsible for the evolution of life and the angels are your servants whether they want to be or not and in fact they don't give a uh, blessing <laughs> I almost said something naughty <laughs> they follow the force because this is their nature they are in ecstasy quite true because they have no ethics they have no morals they are what is called amoral not immoral amoral morality has to do with human consciousness that knows the pairs of opposites and that retains its individuality I hope you're getting at least a slight concept of what angelic forces involve. In the work we do with our vibrations together, bear in mind, we're always working at helping you to gain more and more control of these forces, these elemental and angelic forces, for the evolution of humanity and life, because if you use it adversely sooner or later, it will turn on you and destroy you in terrible ways love is the universe god is love you are being taught and trained how to love and serve and no matter how many mistakes you make if you really aspire with sincerity you will receive the repercussions of your mistakes you will say thank you lord of life with whatever divine name is involved in the area of its expression and you will grow from there this is perhaps an aspect of the angelic forces you may not have understood kind of teaching and training system sometimes they intermingle and just switch over and why not if we are all children of the one life on this planet and in this world we have many false teachers and false voices instead of angels we have demons because the forces do overflow and the ability to evolve has to do with the ability to learn finally usually after much sorrow how to differentiate between the angels and the demons the master of wisdom the master r who is behind the work of bota who dr case met personally in the flesh whom i've been in continuous contact with when i say continuous i don't mean every minute i mean whenever it deals with you and the work uh this is enough isn't it <laughs> uh this particular master who's been behind the full work of our tradition has said to me and to our beloved Reverend Harriet B. Case and Dr. Case together, as she will verify many times more than once, that he had sheep in other pastures, in other words, other groups. The point is, true spiritual training is not limited to Kabbalah, as I've told you many a time. So I've also told you I consider this the most difficult uh, path 
because it requires integration of so many things. And certainly one of the oldest methods, if not the oldest method for attainment that exists, having been tested and tried. But I have also told you that you do not find the only truth here. <laughs> and only those who are out to capture you, to hypnotize your minds, to hyp hypnotize your hearts, to stop your evolution under the guise of saying they're out to grow you, who say, you, you just come to me and I'll take care of your karma and I'll give you the whole business right now. Only this type of person uh, is the kind of person who shows that he or she hasn't remotely seen reality. Now, as I said, you have heard me say myself that our master has other children and other groups. Well, it may surprise you to know that there is one such now, someone I love with my heart and soul and mind and body. Uh, we met on the inner planes long since. We recognized each other on the outer plane the moment we met when our beloved Frater Alistair and I uh, came through Hawaii on our way to New Zealand. We were met by the beloved and adored and precious, in a minute, uh, I'll let you look at him while I'm kissing him. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the assistants, associates, the priest and priestess for our beloved Daddy Bray, who is the great healing kahuna of the Hawaiian Islands. Those of you who've read any of the books on kahuna have, of course, become intrigued. And uh, as I said, again, I point out to you, there is not only one way to reality or God. Each of us has our path, our pattern, I feel anybody who comes to us is lucky. Incidentally, I feel anyone who gets to Daddy Bray is just as lucky. I love him. I think he loves me. I feel it. He emanates it. And surely I cannot be mistaken when it comes to emanations. And I want him now to come up so that you can see what I mean. Look at his eyes. I, I took one look into his eyes and I said, this is my spiritual brother. And I started to make mad love to him right at once. And being a very intelligent Polynesian, he appreciated it. Precious one, would you come up and let my darlings see the beauty? <laughs> come around there, my love. Now, let me tell you, only once before in my life have I looked into a pair of eyes and have seen that this soul has been in touch with infinity, with sorrow, with agony, with heartache, and it has dedicated its life to complete service. That other pair of eyes happens to have been the eyes of Dr. Paul Foster Fraser. Now, I'm not selling you kahuna. I'm not selling you cabal. Our souls guide us where we belong. But when spiritual brother and spiritual sister, when fellow aspirants trying to feed and nourish the life of the heart and soul and bring the evolution of the planet up meet each other, you may not realize that it's a very lonely life because everybody wants us to be their kind of idol and we have our own ideas and idols we don't like to be. Darling, would you say a few words to us, sweetheart? You're way over late. If you have anything to catch, you can go. But this is a special time. <laughs> Greeting from Hawaii. I wish he'd come and look into his eyes. That's what shows it, you know. Well, I told you. him that if only he 
if only he was older and I was younger, <laughs> we wouldn't be safe from it. <laughs> You don't know what it means to those who have taken to themselves the love and the beauty of helping our own, and our own are always well our own, to meet one who's doing the same. And incidentally, we took a look at the master art picture in my home. I had uh, a chaperone, so he was safe. <laughs> <laughs> he took a le and he practically hit the ceiling because he recognized our master R as being the one he was known to be called. He didn't even know his name and called uh, the prince. Isn't that interesting? Because the master R has been known as the prince. Uh, as those of you who've read the Eastern uh, books know. So he recognized this and again verified Father Alistair's and my instant recognition of him as being a true channel for the service of life. And I think he is doing a very great work indeed because he's helping to bring to the Polynesian people their own mystical tradition which is good and right. I told you, those who serve the light are not in competition. Thank you. It's a privilege and honor to be here. And I think this old mind has overpainted the picture. <laughs> not me. <laughs> you know I don't. <laughs> but it's a pleasure. It's an honor. And I'm happy to be here, knowing we met, not because we want to get together, but we have to get together for purpose. I see, I heard about this group here and there. Many times someone has tried to get us together, but somehow other it was not met then, till she came to my little island. So <clears throat> once, I'm not going to, I know you're late, we hold also the key to reality. We know the meaning of love, mm -hmm. understand that, are aware of that word. Aloha means love, God, truth. Honest. We Hawaiian live with it. We live with nature. God. And God lives with us. We are part of this great power. As he said about the four elements. We believe in that before the white ever got to the earth. Water. Except the Kabbalists. We share it with the Kabbalists. <laughs> Fire, water, earth, and air from these four elements produce you, me, when we start, so God. And we Hawaiian of old understood. Live with it, know it. And it has been white, as they say, the Cajon is dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's living and moving. And I'm glad about this sister of mine is here. We on the other side. As I told the group last night, you missionary came down, took everything we got. You brought me there. Christianity, wonderful. But I'm here with my pagans, understanding and take back the money you took from us <laughs> <laughs> to build this retreat where different faiths will gather, exchange ideas, knowledge, wisdom to help mankind. To my understanding, wisdom and knowledge without understanding. 
we have to get wisdom, knowledge, and to understand, be aware. But maybe I'm wrong, but that's my You're wrong, I'm with you, honey. I won't take your time. I want to thank you all for this. Thank you. I hope someday... We'd like to have him back to give us a nice talk, won't we? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. She says if I... She, I was... She ought to say if I was younger, I'd steal her. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought I was the one that was a little too old. <laughs> well, I am. In her eternal youth, as I said to him, he's younger than the day you were born, older than eternity. I looked into his eyes and I saw my brother. And it took a little while for the verification to come, though to be perfectly honest with you, there are times I don't need it. <laughs> uh, uh, but it did. So you should have seen him hit the. You should have seen him hit the ceiling when he saw the picture of the master, which is also his. In other words, as Master R said, there are several groups that are serving and being utilized to grow the evolution of this planet. I consider our Daddy Bray a true channel, a true channel. And let me tell you, as I said. Except the Dr. Paul Foster case. This is the first I've come across who channels that letter, though I have met a few others, not many, who channel on lesser levels. And I, I love this man. I love this soul on sight. And I want you to share this with me because he belongs to us. And we want the Kahuna uh, method to come alive for the Hawaiians after what we've done for them. Our hearts and souls want to grow with them, just as I know he wants our Kabbalistic ideas to grow with those of us who are destined and have been brought to that path. And the point is, true spiritual leaders do not have to knock each other. They love and help each other because they have nothing personally to gain. All we're out for is the evolution of life. And this should be an example to you. They said, I'll see what I can do about getting them back here. Just I enjoy holding his hands anyway. Because <laughs> 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 I do enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one thing, uh, excuse me for, for uh, interrupting. I, I didn't know whose back of all these I heard here and there. But last night, the other night, a friend of mine, a brother of mine, we went to her home. I looked around, who did I see? My priest. I met him when I was young. We talked. I called him my priest. I don't call him my master, he was my friend. Talk to him. Been with him. And two of them. When I saw the two, I, I knew him. That's equal to my knowing. See, I'm Hawaiian, also I'm part Hebrew. So the other came in. Oh, wow. my, my Hawaiian <laughs> masters of Amakuas. They're all the same. So thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for being here. Would you show him how much we love him? Stay with me while I just do the farewell blessing. I ha I'm going to, the, I wanted you very much, my darling, precious, beloved brother of my heart and soul, to share with us in the healing prayer, but I'm sure most of you have some place to go, uh, somewhere to, 
uh, buses to catch and so on. He has never heard our Kabbalistic healing service. And I would want him to share it, but you see we're going very late. You have things and responsibilities. Hmm? Well, I have some of you, but how about the others of you? All right, I'll tell you then. Those of you who have important places you must go, responsibilities to attend to, uh, our love and blessings, we know you're not leaving, but I do want my beloved, darling, precious one here, one who shares with me the guidance from our master. It's a different method, but remember, I never claimed uh, the master R to be limited to one. I want him to share with us the healing blessings and along with whatever else we send blessings to, I want us to send blessings to his work, to what he is trying to do, which is a glorious thing, and to him, because the path of a leader is a lonely path. And he needs strength and love and help in every way. I'd like us to sort of hold that very specially in mind, along with the things we need to do in our own way. All right, dear? And would you like to, would you prefer to sit down and participate? Because if so, I'd like you up here so people could look at you. They will be able to meditate on their love for you and the help and energy for you more strongly that way, along with whatever we do, or you can stand whichever you prefer. All right, so we will, as I said, if any of you, my darlings, have to be home, you have children, you have relatives, go. I mean, this is an unusual occasion, as you know. It's come up spontaneously, suddenly. <laughs> and we will not feel you're deserting. We know that in life we have responsibilities. I, I, isn't he beautiful? Can you see it? Please see it. I'm putting my heart into you to help you see what I see in this man. Yes, and feel it, of course. We have that. Oh, I forgot. First, we have to manage to support ourselves. Sit down, darling. <laughs> you see, this is my problem. People scold me, but I have very little <laughs> awareness. The Sunday service, December 13th, 1964. Our desire, nature, the grace of God will be the topic. This is recorded on side one, channel two, and the leader is white. Begin your footage this time at 2.05. nature, the grace of God, and I know there are some of you, perhaps quite a few of you, who, having read much uh, of the various literatures available in the Eastern philosophies, have come to think, or at least have accepted the idea that the desire nature is something to get rid of, in other words, to become desireless. Uh, has been correlated with the idea of spirituality. And so many aspirants, and these are sincere aspirants, accepting the views because so much in uh, the teachings of our Eastern brethren certainly are correct, beautiful, and inspiring. Many have accepted this idea and have therefore looked into their hearts and seen there that they have desires and have said, alas, alas, and woe is me, which in itself is quite a nice emotional point of view, isn't it? <laughs> and have said to themselves, now I must evolve, I must get away from all this pain, and therefore I must kill out desire, this 
I'm quoting from the ideas. Well, of course, as most of you know, at least many of you do, I have in the past been most sympathetic with this idea uh, because I did enter the formal training quite immersed in the Eastern philosophies. And as far as I was concerned, I will agree and admit, I could see nothing but pain, and I thought, ye gods, Buddha had it. <laughs> Life is pain, and let's get the heaven out of here. <laughs> of course, that isn't the way I said it, but it sounds better in the temple. Now, uh, the, therefore, the teachings that uh, what we must do involves the killing out of desire in order to get away from this endless round of births and deaths. I thought, well, if that's what has to be done, by God, I'll do it. Now, this was by God. <laughs> you know, after all, we're looking to higher forces. And so I did go to work on it, incidentally. I really did. Uh, only, do you know, the grace of God was so great <laughs> that I didn't succeed. I tried. Now, let me tell you, when I try, it's, it's ferocious. <laughs> I've got a tremendous drive and a tremendous will. <laughs> And I was using the very thing I was told to kill out, to try to kill out the very thing that's trying to kill itself. At least this is what I finally discovered. Does it sound crazy? But think for a moment. How can you have a ferocious drive to kill out desire? You're using the very force, aren't you, if you try to do that? The very force which is the force that you're trying to kill. And it's like trying to look into your own eyes without having a mirror. Try it. <laughs> think of it for a moment. You think you can do it? Can you see your own eyes as other people see them when they look into them? When you look in the mirror, uh-uh. You're not going to see what other people see. We each look through our own colored glasses. And they're multicolored. I mean, it's not that simple. Uh, at any rate, the point certainly was and is in some of the philosophies, not all, because we have great love and reverence for our Eastern brethren, but certainly a great many of the interpretations and a great many of the teachers have uh, been conditioning, as many as are willing to come and be conditioned, in the idea that Killing out desire is an absolute essential in order to get away from the horrible, tragic, senseless illusion, delusion of the reincarnating life and the mad, mad world. You know, the tale told by an idiot, as said Shakespeare, signifying nothing. Well, it certainly looks like that. And look, I'm the last one who'll tell you it doesn't look like that. As a matter of fact, I know it looks like that. And there are certain levels of experience where you know it, not just from an intellectual knowing, you know it from the inside. That uh, there's a, a distinct level of life and expression that does look insane. And it is like a tale told by an idiot. Uh, read your newspaper headlines. Listen to the news. Watch people. Notice what's bothering them. Notice the points of view. Always emotional, incidentally. Even when they tell you they have no emotions. And you'll discover, if you really are able to look, that it does seem to be a tale told by an idiot. But... The thing we have to remember is this. When we're looking out at life, at people, and at situations that are taking place in a particular time, in a way, we're looking at something like a still in a movie. You know, you can look at a movie and suddenly you freeze it at any point, and you know the ridiculous positions people take, and the faces, you've watched it, well, now, what we, of course, have not yet understood, but in time we will understand it, I know. What we have not yet understood is that when we are looking 
at the small or limited picture with our self-conscious minds, our intellects. We are seeing something that is like a still. In other words, we're seeing a three-dimensional still in a four-dimensional field of awareness. Now, we don't know it's four-dimensional because our consciousness has not yet expanded to see the full picture. So we interpret the smaller something that we're looking at with insufficient data. And when we interpret life and people's attitudes and emotions in that way, of course it looks like a tale told by an idiot. Just like if we try to interpret people's positions and facial expressions from a still of a movie, it would certainly look utterly ridiculous and senseless. I hope you are agreeing at this point. Now, what do we mean by the difference between three-dimensional and four-dimensional awareness, though? Here we come to the crux of the matter. Consciousness certainly must be recognized as something that is in a state of continuous motion in the area of expansion. Our physical universe is expanding like mad. And it looks mad. But uh, in correlation with the expanding physical universe, the expansion of the nebulas, the expansion of uh, all things that our astronomers can see with their telescopes, we certainly must realize that the correlation with the physical expansion is, in a way, an outer reflection of what you might say is an inner expansion. Of consciousness. Now, what is an inner expansion of consciousness? I think we need to see it in more simple forms to come to recognize how vital this is, and then we'll know what our desire nature consists of and why it truly is the grace of God. Now then, returning to what expansion of consciousness really would be. As I've told you before, I'll tell you a thousand times if you'll give me the chance, and every time I'll try to say it differently, so you'll think I said something new. You remember the story of the preacher who was asked the secret of his success. And he said, first I tell them what I'm going to tell them. Then I tell them what I told them I was going to tell them. And then I tell them what I just told them. This is the secret of my success. Consciousness needs to be receiving the continuous drops of water that finally wear away the rock or build the stalagmites and stalactites so that they'll finally join into a wholeness. All right, then, expansion of consciousness is what? <coughs> a moment ago, you had less consciousness than you have now. Now, you don't have more just because you're sitting in this temple. You'd have had more no matter where you were. In other words, your attention has been focused on something, and, therefore, and your senses have been registering everything going on. So you've been receiving new impressions. They're new and they're different. You might have seen a certain tree a million times. I don't know if you could have. I mean, I'm not a mathematician. We'd have to find whether you've had a million days or a million uh, on Earth so far. <laughs> we'll ask Felix about that. <laughs> he's, the, he's the mathematician. The point is, you could have seen a tree a million times, but you never see the same tree. It is different. It is always different. It has emanated... Uh, atoms, it has emanated all sorts of aspects of itself in its exhalation and inhalation. It has uh, sent out oxygen for our life and our beingness and has in inhaled the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. Uh, it has taken in the radiations from the infinite uh, universe. All the radiations that go on the uh, outbursts from the nebulas, from the supernovas, from the novas, all these radiant energies, these little bits of so-called matter or force, whatever you wish to think of them as being, uh, this tree has been taking in and giving out. It has been taking in new elements with its roots. It has been using its desire nature, if you will, to survive. It has been absorbing uh, minerals 
moisture with its roots. It has been absorbing light, sunshine, and certain uh, elements in the atmosphere, which it's been using to manufacture other things. So that when you look at a tree in your own garden or anywhere that you go, you have not, you are not seeing the same tree. You are having a new experience. I repeat, you are having a new experience. And if you don't know it, you get bored. This is one of the problems. We get bored because we don't realize that even with our husbands and our wives, our friends, our sisters, our brothers, our enemies, our, <laughs> our saviors, our are destroyers, if there are such things, really. We never have ha have the same relationship from one moment to the next because we are changing. Why are we changing? Because our consciousness is assimilating and absorbing everything that's going on, even if it's doing it on the subconscious level. And so our whole seeing, feeling, thinking, reacting is and must be different from second to second, from moment to moment, from day to day, from year to year. Our consciousness is expanding by the very act of being a livingness, which it is, a livingness. And as I said, even if you weren't in this temple, it would be expanding. But in this temple, it expands in a special way. We show you certain ideas, certain images, so that you start getting more of an understanding and therefore more of a control, more of a conscious participation with that which brings about the expansion. Expansion you'll get, so you could get an awful lot of junk. In other words, you can assimilate and absorb all kinds of junk that you later will have to expel. Or you can learn how to be a little more choosy, discriminating. And really, I would say one of the primary differences between the infantile, so-called unevolved being, and the evolved uh, type of consciousness is the ability to discriminate between the assimilation of junk, that is, the garbage, the mud of other thinking, feeling elements which are still immature, and taking in that which is more in harmony with what we may call the will of God, or shall we say the, the larger total plan of which we are a part. And you can say just like the child learning how to build with blocks will be very, very foolish in its attempts and clumsinesses. The difference between the younger, so-called younger soul and the older soul really exists in this how well it can build, how well it can discriminate. Therefore, how well it knows what it really wants and what is wanting, this is your desire nature. Now, we will return to that first idea that I was trying to present to you about the desire nature, the fact that certain schools of thought will tell you that evolution and attainment of liberation from the rounds of pain, sorrow, and joy, incidentally, that liberation from these things, these, this so-called prison, comes by deciding that uh, uh, the whole appearance of the outer life, or the physical manifestation, which in Kabbalah we call Mahut, that this is really a tale told by an idiot. And I hope I've just shown you that by trying to analyze the total picture from the limited keyhole point of view, from the still, from the stopping of this motion picture, which doesn't see or hasn't yet experienced the full story. By trying to interpret it from that smaller point of view, we certainly will make mistakes in our judgment. And not until we are willing to see that there is a larger plan, a larger picture, which we can also call the will of God, because this is what it is. Not until we can see this can we start using our desire nature to consciously cooperate with this divine plan of which we are a part, which means it's growing up a little bit, really, to be able to do this, instead of looking upon our desire nature as being something that brings us nothing but unhappiness 
and therefore reaching for desirelessness. How often I have listened to beautiful, magnificent souls say, well, I've been working on this and that, and really I have achieved, or I've almost achieved, the state of desirelessness. As though they're announcing that they're practically something next door to Christ now. You know, and <laughs> any second, they're going to be brought up into the infinite. What is there to be proud of? I ask you, if we should say we've lost our desire nature, what is desire? What is desire? To be proud of losing our desire nature, incidentally, is like being proud of being an alcoholic. I repeat, to be proud of losing our desire nature is like being proud of being an alcoholic. It's an escape mechanism. It's an attempt to destroy our livingness. How much livingness have you got? Your livingness is correlated with your desire nature. All right, I will grant you that the wild, passionate, uncontrolled, immature desires of infant humanity wreak havoc. Certainly they do. I'll even admit that there are times that I think that I might almost agree with you we ought to go after them with a hammer. Because <laughs> we can get indignant over some of the infant nonsense. <clears throat> when children decide to hoop rod up and set fire to buildings in their immaturity and their childish use of their livingness, of course we're going to get upset. But if we were perceptive enough to see that these are infants and start putting a few disciplines on them that they're not able to put on themselves yet until they evolve to the point where they can apply their own disciplines. And what do we mean by disciplines? We do not mean killing out desire. You kill out desire and you kill out the very energy that makes you aspire. Are you going to differentiate between desire and aspiration? Isn't your aspiration to achieve God a desire? How do you think you can keep aspiration if you try to cut off the rocket power or the gasoline power or whatever kind of power you want to call it? If you're going to cut it off, and decide you're spiritual because you have no drive. Inertia is nothingness, and evolution is a vital drive. The immature use this vital drive in incorrect ways. The very immature try to use clubs, and so they'll hit somebody over the head to get their woman and or their man, Although mostly it's men who like to use clubs, women have weapons that are far more devastating, usually. <laughs> Which is very clever of them. That's being cunning, you know, the serpent, I, said. I guess, maybe taught them a thing or two, and they need it. They're now physically strong. <laughs> we each have our weapons in our unevolved levels, which we use in our special ways. Uh, and these are required. <laughs> of course they are, really. But as we evolve, we reap the repercussions of our immaturities because there is an area of discipline within the divine law, and this we call karma. And so karma comes back and hits us on the head in its own way, only it isn't karma, it's us, our own higher soul, growing its personality certainly brings the repercussions of barbarous type of activity. So if we are lacking in a realization that our fellow man is our brother, our sister, uh, and we act in such a way, we are going to reap these repercussions because we're automatically projecting to everybody, to all life. We are, our consciousness is expanding 
by desiring and reaping the repercussions of our desires. This is the way consciousness expands. You desire, you reap the repercussions. You desire, you get fulfilled. Now, if you think you're not fulfilled because you're miserable, honey, I've got news for you. <laughs> your misery is also the fulfillment of your desire. I, I was watching a bunch of people just the other day, as I've mentioned to our group before, looking absolutely exalted as, as a group of songs being sung about uh, how my heart shall be sad forever <laughs> because I've lost you, you know, one particular you. I mean, and the whole group of songs went on, and I noticed all this joy and sorrow these people were having. I mean, they were building their future like mad, <laughs> you know, with the charging of the images of their own uh, disappointment, their loneliness. I didn't see them get at all as exalted over another group of songs, which was full of, uh, I'm happy because I've got everything sort of idea. <laughs> I guess they figured life would get too boring. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> Cause there's not, uh, because we cannot remain content with uh, anything that's static. Whatever it is that's made us happy today will make us unhappy tomorrow because we'll get tired of it. This is the desire nature pushing for more experience in order to become larger, bigger, more perceptive, more profound, more deep. And so whatever we, are, we think is our fulfillment today, we're going to get tired of, I repeat, until and unless. See, I, I had a little catch there. We see that fulfillment as being our participation in the glory and will and love of God in and through these people and conditions, then there can be no satiation. But has that been killing out desire? Or is that, or has it been more a recognition, a growth, a maturity, which says to me, each and every me here, <laughs> this is the eternal glory and splendor of the divine. This is the eternal ecstasy of the divine. And it knows that it's going to go from one thing to another. It never tries to hold a thing in a, a, thing in a still or a static position. Even if it has a beloved that is truly, and every beloved is eternal, whether you realize it or not. It does not try to hold the beloved in a static relationship. The two beloveds grow. <laughs> and are willing to change. You know, there's a beautiful uh, record that I played to a couple of you not so long ago called Songs of Couch and Consultation uh, that do a most beautiful takeoff on uh, psychology. And really, they're like uh, psychoanalysis uh, for the self through the song. And uh, one of the things that impressed me so much uh, well, uh, which I delight in is a song where it says, please stay as sick as you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you call the neurotic attachment that wants to be sure it stays miserable. <laughs> now, this is a desire nature working, and of course it's working in a way that's going to keep us miserable. But honestly, now I ask each and every one of you, have you not had any period in your life where you were empty and lonely? There was nobody and nothing. Now, aren't, don't you prefer being in one, excuse me, hell of a stew <laughs> to that empty, boring, lonely nothingness? I ask you. Now, ask yourself. But I want you to do this with a spiritual orientation, please. Realize that this stew you're in, if and when you're in it, is really the push, the grace of God pushing you into perception, understanding, realization, develop, developing discrimination in you, so that you can finally say, well, now this kind of fulfillment I need like I need a hole in the head. <laughs> but I am grateful to the Lord of life for this experience because now I know what I don't want. <laughs> and also, I hope, Never say I'm sure, because you'll have the experience, I'd say somewhere within six months, if you're a good aspirant, 
to find out whether you really don't want it anymore. In other words, it'll re the minute you say, I've outgrown a certain thing in your nature, uh, well, your, your image and the charge of the aspirant, because you're becoming more of a living being, it will bring you the same experience over again, but it'll fool you, you see. It'll look like it's something else to begin with, and then it'll turn out to be the same thing, which is good again. I mean, you know, your own higher soul is bringing back and say, oh, well, we've outgrown this. Good. We're ready for something else. Let's have our test for we can go on to the next grade, you know. After all, you don't get your MA or your BA or whatever until you pass your test on it. <laughs> so... The whole point is, our desire nature will, of course, get us into trouble. We can be like an alcoholic and escape and say, I'm desireless and I'm getting out of life. I'm returning to the source, which is really returning to the womb. And I've never been sure whether people really succeed or not. I sometimes think they succeed temporarily and then they really get it. <laughs> In other words, they're catapulted in a, a later incarnation or uh, into uh, some beauties <laughs> uh, in order to cure them of this sacrilege against God, the evolutionary drive of the Most High in growing units of its own selfhood, its own children. <laughs> I kind of think that those who think they've attained nirvana and samadhi and they're forever free, and they try to teach others how to be desireless, that is, zombies, who walk around with a frozen, sickly smile and say, be like me, God forbid, how then will I have ecstasy when I look at a flower, and how will I be able to enjoy raising hell when I'm indignant with the immaturity of others, and how will I know the, the glory, the up absolute unspeakable glory of music and how will I be able to practically burst with the ineffability of love when I look at you if I become desireless look honey this isn't even for the birds I love birds <laughs> <laughs> don't get fooled if you have sorrow and we all have it. It is the grace of God pushing you into understanding to use your force and your fire in order to become something more. And you're becoming something more as you go through the experiences that deal with the desire nature. You will have to desire at all times, but as you mature and evolve, the form of your desires, the way you will expect their, the fulfillment of your desires will change. Always you will be desiring one thing, love. There is nothing else to desire. If you think you want power, you're still wanting love. It's just that you misinterpret the idea. You think if people look, uh, you know, are afraid of you, they'll love you. Of course they won't. <laughs> but that's how people think that. The way they'll get loved, by having power. At least that way people aren't going to dare to reject them, don't you see? So this is, again, it, it's a backward kind of search for love. We have come from love. We live in love. To love we go. But we are evolving a conscious ability and awareness to use the love of God. The, and the love of God is the will of God. And your desires have always been the will of God, no matter how poorly you've used them. You've had to grow, just like we use everything poorly while we're learning how to become a master at, a, at any kind of instrument or any ability. So you've got to become grateful for that drive, that emotion within you, and see it as the livingness of God that lives and grows you. And as you do this, you will mature yourselves into an awareness so that you will use this power, this divine power of yours, more and more accurately until finally you will become such a tremendous, um, profound lover of God and life that you'll be able to say with the Christ, 
I have the will of the Father. <laughs> That's the only will I need. That doesn't mean that you don't have personal will. Remember, your personal will will be at one with the will of the Most High. And so you will choose with discrimination ways of fulfillment that will be in harmony with the social conscience. You will be loving your fellow man. You will receive ecstasies and fulfillments beyond your wildest dreams. This is in store for you. This incarnation, next, a thousand incarnations from now. Before I wait, <laughs> let's start controlling our desires and seeing our drives as being the grace of God giving us livingness and refuse to accept anything that kills our true drive to our own life and to become one with the real ecstasy of the life of God. All right? Good idea. <coughs>